April 19, 1775. The first shots of the Revolutionary War were fired in various towns throughout the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And the, the news of the bloodshed quickly spread along the eastern seaboard. And thousands of volunteers converged at Cambridge, Mass., thereby establishing the Continental Army. So from that point forward, April 19, 1775, every person living in the American colonies was either a loyalist or an insurrectionist, a subject of King George III or a rebel against their king. There was no in-between position, no compromise, no middle way. You were either one or the other. And so it is and has always been with every king in every kingdom of the world. On May 6th of this year, King Charles III was crowned the new king of England. It's believed that 400 million people, 400 million people watched the ceremony as it was broadcast worldwide with a hundred different heads of state from various nations present there at Westminster Abbey. And after the crown was, was placed upon the king's head, the congregation there proclaimed, God save the king. But that was not the proclamation of every Brit on that day. Apparently, there were around a thousand protesters gathered along the procession route, chanting and, and displaying banners proclaiming, Not my king. They desire a, a de democratically elected head of state, not some monarch. The same thing happened when King Charles III arrived in Edinburgh, Scotland about a month later to be presented with the Scottish crown jewel. Many were gathered there to declare, not my king. And while King Charles' reign here in 2023 is obviously far more symbolic and less consequential than that of King George's in 1775, those contrasting pronouncements still highlight that there's no in-between response to one who is claiming to be your king. It is either God save the king or it is not my king. It is either praise or it is protest, subjection or insurrection. There is no middle way. Well, so too with the king of heaven and earth. I invite you to turn with me to Psalm 1, verse 1. You can find it on page 489 in the first half of the Pew Bible, very near the center of the Bible. Psalm 1, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord to you. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us pray. Father, King of creation, King of heaven and earth, we bow before you as your royal subjects. And we implore you to, to open our eyes to better see the beauty of your decrees. That we may come to better know you and to draw nearer to you. Bless the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, if you're familiar with the book of Psalms, it may catch your eye that neither of the first two Psalms contain a, a superscription. For example, look at the beginning of Psalm 3 with your Bible still open in front of you. What you might call verse 0 says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Well, that verse 0 of Psalm 3, it's not some heading that was added to your Bible by the Bible publisher. Rather, it's part of the inspired original text. In 116 of the 150 psalms, so more than 77% of the psalms, bear a superscription like that 
in the original. Without such a superscription, it can be hard to say with any certainty who wrote a particular psalm and, and under what circumstances. However, that being said, there's more to say about the authorship of these first two psalms, even though they don't have a superscription. The book of Psalms is divided in the original text into five different books, with book one containing the first 41 psalms. And of those first 41 of book one, there's only four that don't have a superscription, including Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. The 37 that do have a superscription in book one all are attributed to having been written by King David. And again, even though Psalm 2 doesn't have a superscription, the New Testament explicitly tells us that David wrote Psalm 2. That's in Acts chapter 4. So given the placement of Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 together, given the, the similarity of the message between these two psalms, given what appears to be an, an intentional literary device linking the opening words of Psalm 1, blessed is the man, with the closing words of Psalm 2, blessed are all, well, virtually all scholars agree that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are to be seen as a single unit, almost a single psalm, both flowing from the pen of King David. Together, these two psalms, they, they don't only set the tone for the 148 psalms that follow, but as, as one scholar puts it, they function as a lens through which the rest of the psalms are to be read. Well, how so? How, do, how does these opening psalms, Psalm 1, Psalm 2, how do they serve as a lens through which to read all the others? Well, it's because they introduce the two dominant themes of the entire book of psalms. God's word in Psalm 1. And God's reign in Psalm 2. God's word and God's reign. So we're going to treat these two psalms together. Beginning with verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Both of these first two psalms present us with two ways to live. The first way being the way of the world. The progression from walking to standing to sitting, it, it seems to be a depiction of, of an incremental hardening of a sinner's heart over time. To walk in the counsel of the wicked is to be so influenced by the world around you that you begin to live like the world around you, even though you still claim to, to be a follower of the God of the Bible. You're walking in the counsel of the wicked. Ah, but then you, you begin to stand in the way of sinners. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean standing in their way, hindering their path, but rather it means openly taking your stand with them. Not just living like them, but now identifying as one of them, no longer claiming to be a follower of the God of the Bible. That's the progression. Then finally, sitting, sitting in the seat of scoffers. Well, that, that goes even further than standing in the way of sinners. It's one thing not to identify as a follower of the God of the Bible. It's another thing to scoff at. To, to openly mock the teachings of the Bible, to openly label as good what God has called evil, and to openly label as evil what God has called good, encouraging people to embrace the way of the world. That's the way of the scoffer. For example, in Romans chapter 1, as the Apostle Paul describes the, the gradual hardening of people's hearts in their sin over time, with homosexuality giving as a, as a prime example, Paul then writes this in verse 32. He says, Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but here's the thing, they give approval to those who practice them. Paul is saying that the pinnacle, the pinnacle of a sin-hardened heart is openly affirming other people in their sin. Again, to openly affirm someone in their sin, to give approval of it, is the pinnacle of a sin-hardened heart. It's the pinnacle of scoffing at God and at His law. It's the opposite of love. The opposite of loving God and the opposite of loving others. So you fail to seek their good and lead them into evil. That's the first way to live, the way of the world. But, but in contrast, verse 2, as for the blessed man, well, his delight is in the law of the Lord. The law, that is the Torah, the instruction of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, his Torah, his word, 
blessed man meditates day and night. Notice that the the stated motivation for pursuing the, the way of the word rather than the way of the world it's not merely the blessings that will come if you follow the way of the word. It's that the blessed man genuinely, genuinely delights in the way of the word. He genuinely delights in God's law and God's ways, and so he follows it. You could say he has tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that his ways are best, that he can be trusted in his word. Well, how? How, how does a person come to discover this, become the blessed man? No one is born with this kind of delight in the ways and word of God. It's a, it's a palate that must be developed and matured over time. You must develop this taste that the Lord is good in his word. But, but how do you do that? Well, you do it by meditating on God's law, on his word, day and night. It's fitting that, that this instruction comes to us in this book of the Psalms of King David. Because hundreds of years before the first coronation of the first king of Israel, God decreed of his kings, like King David, that, quote, when the king sits on the throne of his kingdom, God says, he shall write for himself in a book, a copy of this law, this Torah, the five books of Moses, approved by the Levitical priests. And it, his his own personal writing of the word of God, shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, He may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. Deuteronomy 17, 18. Yes, even the king of a great nation with all of his daily responsibilities, with all of his concerns and distractions, surrounded with enemies desiring to to destroy his people, yes, even the king of Israel was to take the time to daily meditate on God's word night and day. And yes, even you, modern man, modern woman, with all your daily responsibilities, with all your concerns and distractions, yes, even you are to to take the time to daily meditate upon God's Word. That you may grow in your delight in God and in His law. That you may mature your palate, taste and see that the Lord is good. Grow in your delight of Him. There's no middle way here. One or the other is going to exert a greater influence on you, either the world or the Word. And if you're not consciously, fastidiously meditating daily upon the Word, it's a certainty that it's the world that will be exerting greater influence upon you. So as you look at your life, which which is having the greater influence upon you? Are you pursuing the way of the world or are you pursuing the way of the Word? Well, which of the following verses is a better description of your life and of the fruit that your life is bearing? Verses 3, for four, three and 4, stands in number 2. He says, He, the man who lives by the way of the word, is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its, its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. So you are either a, a beautiful tree bearing fruit for its owner, or you are the husk surrounding a kernel of wheat that is discarded into the wind, chaff. You're one or the other. But, but what does it mean that the man who lives by the way of the word prospers in all that he does? Is this talking about earthly prosperity? Well, yes, to some degree it is, at least proverbially speaking. That is, it's normally the case that those who live in accord with God's design for human flourishing, who follow the way of the word, prosper in this life, while those who live contrary to that design and follow the way of the world wither. That's often the case. Hence the book of Proverbs. That's proverbial wisdom. But, we must confess, those are Proverbs and, of course, are not promises. In fact, the the book of Psalms, many of the Psalms are filled with cries of the faithful people of God who are suffering at the hands of the wicked, who are prospering. Psalm 37 and 73 come to mind. And thus, that this language in the Psalms of prospering, it draws our attention to the eternal life that lies beyond this earthly life, which is precisely where the last two verses of Psalm 1 take us. But, but even before we transition to the last stanza, before transitioning to the prospering or the withering that will take place on the last day, 
and that will persist for all of eternity. There is more to be said about this contrast between a, a fruit-bearing tree and a piece of chaff. There's more to be said with respect to our experience of life here and now. It's as Jesus declared. John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus said, Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is saying that even in the face of great adversity, those who pursue the way of the word experience a kind of spiritual prospering, a kind of spiritual flourishing as rivers of living water flow out of their hearts, bearing spiritual fruit that nourishes others. It's primarily a spiritual flourishing here and now. But then moving on to the final stanza, verses 5 and 6. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, ste stepping back and looking at these three stanzas, verses 1 and 2, they, they focus on the choice between two ways to live and on what is having the greater influence upon you, the, the word or the world. And then verses 3 and 4 focus on the fruit born by those two ways of living, primarily here in this life. Well, verses 5 and 6 focus on what lies at the end of each way. The day of judgment awaits us all. Jesus describes it this way. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, he will separate people from one from another as a, a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Then will he place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And these, those on the left, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life, eternal destinies. But notice that, that Psalm 1, Psalm 1, the end of it, it describes these eternal destinies a little differently than Jesus did in Matthew 25. Psalm 1 doesn't merely say that those who live by the way of the world will perish, while those who live by the way of the word will be spared. Something further is being emphasized here. Look again at the first half of verse 6. Instead of saying, the way of the righteous leads to salvation, or, or something to that effect, it puts it this way, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. What does that mean? What does it mean that the Lord knows the way of the righteous? He's obviously just as cognizant of the path that leads to death as he is the path that leads to life. He's, he's just as cognizant of the people journey, journeying down one path as he is those journeying down the other path. God knows all things. He's omniscient. So what, what is this verse 6 saying? Well, the same word for knows, that he knows the way of the righteous, well, it's translated as, as chosen and Genesis 18, 19, for example, where the Lord says, I have chosen Abraham. I have known him. Amos 3, verse 2, God says of Israel, You, Israel, only have I known of all the families of the earth. Well, he knows everybody everywhere. He knows the, the details of their hearts. When he says, only you have I known, it's speaking of unique intimacy, of relationship. The language of knowing is about intimate Relationship. And so I think that the various English translations of Psalm 1, verse 6, uh, that render it something like, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, as opposed to the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Well, I think saying watches over is it's a little bit misleading. Yes, the Lord watches over, has his watchful care of those who choose the way of the word. That is part of what it means that he knows them. But, but the primary emphasis of the language that's being used here is the language of intimacy of relationship. So then the contrast, as we step away from Psalm 1 and look at it as a whole, the contrast between the two ways to live, it's not primarily the contrast between one way ending in paradise and another ending in perishing. It's not the contrast between paradise and perishing, it's the contrast between intimacy and exile. The great reward of the way of the word is intimacy with your creator. It's a fitting way to start the book of Psalms. More than any other portion of God's Word, the Psalms are about communing with God. Not only 
uh, does he give us his words in the Psalms, but he gives us words to say back to him. Words that give expression to, to every human emotion and experience. Words of lament. Words of grief and pain. Words of confusion, anxiety, fear. Words of praise and thanksgiving. The Psalms, and thus the Word, are about relationship. And we can distill the main message of the first Psalm in this way. The way of the world leads us far from God. The way of the Word leads us near to God. The way of the Word leads us near to God. It's about intimacy of relationship. But of course, there's a glaring problem as we close out Psalm 1. And that's the fact that none of us have perfectly lived by the way of the Word. We have all, at times and to varying degrees, lived by the way of the world. Even the, the great King David, the, the sweet psalmist of Israel, who was likely the only king of Israel who ever faithfully meditated upon and sought to obey God's law, well, even he did so imperfectly, with his sins of adultery and, and murder recorded for all the world to see in perpetuity. Who then can be counted as part of the congregation of the righteous? None is righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.9. Well, so then, if none are righteous, not even King David, who, who wrote this psalm, who are these righteous ones whom the Lord knows intimately? Well, that's another part of why Psalm 1 and 2 are taken together as a single unit. While Psalm 1 rejoices in the gift of God's Word and the spiritual flourishing and, and intimacy that it brings, Psalm 2 rejoices in the gift of God's Messiah who makes it possible for sinners to be declared righteous and brought into intimacy with God. Psalm 2, verse 1. And don't worry, we'll move through Psalm 2 far more quickly than we move through Psalm 1. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The first question is, who is this Lord's anointed? Well, it's, it's a term that, that can be used simply to refer to the king of Israel. Again, we know from the New Testament that this psalm, Psalm 2, was written by King David. King David was the Lord's anointed king. And yet, th this term, anointed, is often used in contexts like Psalm 2 that are clearly pointing to a particular king of Israel. They're, they're pointing forward to a particular descendant of David whose reign will, will greatly surpass that ever experienced by any king of Israel in the Old Testament. And as we'll see in this psalm, this coming king will reign over all the nations of the earth. This is precisely what God had promised to David. The covenant that God made with David, the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God spoke of an eternal kingdom that's going to be granted to one of David's descendants. That's who he's speaking of as the anointed. When this Hebrew word for anointed, it's Mashiach. When Mashiach gets transliterated into English, what's it become? Messiah. When the Greek translation of it, Christos, when Christos gets translated into English, what is it? Christ. Jesus is the Lord's anointed king, the one being spoken of here. He is the Christ. He is the descendant of David that was promised to come. But the rulers of the earth take counsel together and set themselves against the Lord and against his Christ, seeking to burst, to cast away, to, to throw off their rule over creation. These first few verses of Psalm 2 are echoed in the very first recorded prayer of any Christian in Acts chapter 4. The apostles Peter and John, they've been arrested. They're, they're threatened with punishment of death if they persist in preaching the gospel of Jesus. And then they're released. And quote, they went to their friends and they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And they all, all the Christians gathered together, they, they heard about the threats of death for those who preach Christ. And the Christians lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, 
who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the nations rage, the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly, in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. By murdering Jesus, the Lord's anointed King, the Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles, the people of the earth, were proclaiming, Not my King. But it was all in vain. The question here at the beginning of Psalm 2, Why? Why do the nations rage and the, the people's plot in vain? It's not so much about uh, lamenting that reality, though we do lament that reality. It's not so much about lamenting it as it is asking, how can they be so foolish to think that they can succeed? It's a question every reader of Genesis chapter 3 asks about the serpent and about Adam and about Eve. How can you possibly think this is going to work out? Don't you understand who you're going up against? It shows us that sin is, it's not rational. Sin never makes sense. Continuing verse 4, Psalm 2. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, in contempt. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand the point here. God obviously doesn't laugh at evil in the sense of taking pleasure in it. He certainly doesn't laugh at the suffering caused by the oppressive hands of the wicked. No, that enrages him. The language of laughter here is in response to foolish little kings of the earth thinking that they can succeed in their efforts to overthrow his reign. He laughs at them. He holds them in contempt. While he may allow them uh, to throw off his bonds and, and rebel against him for a season, there will be hell to pay for rebellion. Verse 5. Then, after he laughs at them, he will speak to them in his wrath. He will terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Zion, that is the, the heavenly city where God dwells, what Jerusalem is meant to point to. And next, in verse 7, the Lord's anointed king, the Messiah, Jesus speaks. He says this, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. What day is being described in verse 7 of Psalm 2? When did the Father say these words to the Son, beginning with, You are my Son, today I have begotten you? Hasn't God the Son been the Son from eternity past? Well, yes, but He wasn't eternally a man. God the Son took on flesh at a particular point in time, a particular point in history, being incarnated within the womb of Mary. But what's being described here appears to be a day that came even later in, at the end of his life on earth. In the passage that Sandy Joe read earlier from Romans chapter 1, verse 4, Paul writes that, that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness when? He was declared to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Likewise, Paul preached at Antioch in, in Acts chapter 13. He said, We bring you the good news of what God promised to the fathers. This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Paul draws our attention to Psalm 2 and says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by being risen from the dead. Psalm 2 appears to be describing Jesus' coronation as the king of heaven and earth. And when did that happen? At his resurrection from the dead. That is when it was undeniably proven for all the world to see that Jesus is the one who will judge the living and the dead. 
He is the rider on the white horse whom the Apostle John describes in Revelation 19, saying, From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That is Jesus. The bottom line of Psalm 2 is this. Even the kings of the earth are answerable to the king of kings. Even the kings of the earth are answerable to the king of kings, and thus so too are we. Verse 10. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9.10. We are all commanded to fear God, and yet we're also commanded not to be afraid of God. What's the most common command in all of Scripture? Do not fear. And yet we're commanded to fear. Well, which is it? Well, there's two different kinds of fear of God. Sinful fear of Him trembles in terror of Him. Righteous fear trembles in awe of Him. Sinful fear flees from him. Righteous fear flees to him. For where else would we turn? Finally, verse 12, Psalm 2. Kiss the Son. Kiss the Son. That is, pay homage to him as your rightful king. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. There is no refuge from him. There is only refuge in him. There is no refuge from him and his wrath. There is only refuge in him and his mercy. That refuge in him is only found by bending the knee to his reign, receiving him as both your Savior and your Lord. Receive him as your Savior. Trust that he lived the perfect life of obedience to the way of the word that you have failed to live never straying down the way of the world, and that he died in your place, suffering the death that you deserve for your wandering down the way of the world, that he rose in victory over sin and death for the forgiveness of your sins, that you can be cleansed of your sin, that you can be covered in his righteousness. Receive him as your Savior, and you must also receive him as your Lord. You must turn from the way of the world and embrace the way of the word, for it is through his word that Christ rules his people. There is no middle way. It is either God save the king or not my king. You are either consciously striving to bend the knee to his word or you are still living by the way of the world and thus as a rebel against him and his crown. It's one or the other. There is no middle way. If we reflect upon Psalm 1 and 2, it's helpful to remember that, that the psalms are songs. They're not only meant to be read, they're meant to be sung. So that, so that the words of the Father in Psalm 2, verse 6, are meant to be placed on our own lips as we sing, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. We just sing, as for me. It calls to mind the famous words of Joshua, doesn't it? Joshua, after leading the wilderness generation of Israel to conquer and take possession of the promised land, he gathers all the people and all the leaders of the tribes come to him, and he says to them, quote, Fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your fathers they served in the region beyond the river or the, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24. Every individual, every family, every church must declare, as for me, I will bend the knee to the one true king. As for me, I will bend the knee to the one true king. Choose this day whom you will serve. Will you embrace the way of the world and perish? Or will you embrace the way of the word and live? Let us pray.
Father, we thank you for the gift of your word and the relationship of intimacy that it offers to us. We thank you for the gift of the Messiah by whom we can be cleansed and brought into intimate relationship with you. May every person here today bow their hearts before you and joyfully kiss the Son, receiving him as their king. Grant us clarity of mind. Grant us strength of conviction. Grant us unity of spirit. Grant us boldness to unashamedly proclaim the good news that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings. Bless the preaching of your holy word. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.